Ladies and gentlemen, today we delve into the intriguing life and remarkable contributions of a figure pivotal to the spiritual fabric of our Imperium in recent millennia, militant apostolic Matthieu. His journey from the humbler origins as a priest within the Acronite Mendicants, a branch of the far-reaching missionary Galactica, to becoming a critical spiritual leader alongside the Primarch Gilliman during the Indomitus Crusade and the Plague Wars, marks a trajectory of faith, sacrifice, and divine intervention that is both inspiring and profound. Matthew's tale begins amidst adversity as a captive aboard the Macrag's Honor, seized by the dreaded Red Corsairs. Within the dark confines of this imprisonment, Matthew's unyielding spirit shone brightest. Secretly conducting prayer services, he became a beacon of hope and defiance against the oppressive yoke of his captors. It was here, too, that Mathieu first displayed a miraculous psychic ability, reminiscent of the revered living saints, using the Emperor's light to exorcise a demon from a young soul aboard the vessel. This act of divine intervention hinted at Mathieu's deeper connection to the Emperor's will, a connection that would define his path henceforth. Liberated from captivity, Mathieu's actions during the Indomitus Crusade drew the gaze of the Lord Commander. Despite his reservations and feeling unworthy of high office, Guillemon saw in Mathieu the qualities essential for the role of militant apostolic, succeeding the late Gison. Mathieu's subsequent acceptance of this role marked the beginning of his pivotal influence upon the spiritual morale of the Crusade's countless warriors and the broader Imperium. Mathieu's conviction in the Emperor's divinity and Guillemin's celestial lineage, often in open defiance of the Lord Commander's more secular directives, underscored a complex relationship between faith and governance within our Imperium. Despite his modest self-image, Mathieu harbored the ambition to have Guillemin recognize his divinity, an aspect of the Primarch's identity that evolved significantly by the war's end. Mathieu's legacy is twofold as a martyr whose sacrifice is immortalized in the annals of the Imperium, and as a spiritual guide who influenced the very perception of divinity among the Imperium's highest echelons. His story is not just one of personal ascension and sacrifice, but also a mirror reflecting the complex interplay between faith, duty, and leadership in the vast expanse of our Imperium. Sit and listen closely. Mathieu, for his part, held Gilliman in awe, seeing in him not just the military leader of the Imperium, but a divine figure, a belief Gilliman himself struggled to accept or understand. Mathieu's unshakable conviction in Gilliman's godhood and his own visions of the Emperor's will created a tension between them, mirroring the larger discourse on the role of faith in the Lord Commodore's new Imperium. Throughout the Plague Wars, as the forces of Nurgle desecrated the realm of Ultramar, Mathieu's faith was a light in the darkness, his miracles a testament to the Emperor's power. Yet it was also a source of contention, pushing against Gilliman's more pragmatic, secular approach to leadership. The origins of the Crusade of the Witnesses are deeply intertwined with the miraculous events on Parmenio, where the Emperor's divine intervention purportedly saved Lord Gwilliman. This event, witnessed by many, sparked a fervent movement among the faithful. They sought guidance from Mathieu, whose leadership and visions from the Emperor made him a beacon to the faithful. Mathieu's supposed vision on Eax was a pivotal moment, not just for the Crusade, but for the very soul of the Imperium. He was instructed by a divine mandate, or perhaps madness, to destroy a significant threat to Gilliman. Thus, potentially altering the course of the Plague Wars. Understanding the audacity of launching the Crusade without the Lord Commander's permission is crucial. While seemingly insubordinate, this act was driven by an unshakable faith in the Emperor's will. The culmination of the Crusade of the Witnesses unfolds as a saga of sacrifice and divine intervention, a narrative woven into the fabric of the Imperium's endless war against the forces of chaos. The final act, set within the corroded halls of a Medici facility on Ajax, becomes the stage for an epic confrontation between the forces of purity and pestilence. 
militant apostolic Mathieu, the spiritual beacon of the crusade, emerges as a figure of prophetic destiny, unmarred by the virulent corruption that claims his comrades. Our narrative is not born of myth or legend, but pieced together from the most reliable sources our Imperium offers. Through painstaking efforts, we have gathered first-hand reports from those who stood shoulder to shoulder in battle, testimonies that have been scrutinized and authenticated by the keen eyes of the Inquisition, ensuring that what we share this evening is not merely a tale, but a testament to resolve. Guided by the hand of Mathieu, it was a time when the Emperor's light, though distant, burned fiercely in the hearts of his followers, inspiring a movement that would challenge the most agnostic of the Crusade. As we embark on this journey through time, let us open our minds to the complexities of faith and duty, the sacrifices made in the Emperor's name, and the unyielding courage of those who dared to witness the Divine. Let their stories serve as a beacon, guiding us through the darkness, reminding us of the power of belief and the eternal vigilance required to safeguard our Imperium against the ceaseless tide of heresy and despair. Let us witness their crusade as they did to his glory. The procession of the faithful traversed the first landing Boonswell Highway, a route accommodating the grandeur of the war train, unlike the hydroways typically relied upon in Ajax's transport network. Through the afternoon, into the evening, and under the cover of darkness, they halted at the desolate town of Argardston, roughly 50 miles from first landing. Despite the meager rations and the looming spectre of death awaiting them, confidence buoyed their spirits as they spent the night, fueled by the conviction of faith. Argardston lay deserted, its structures reduced to ashes, its inhabitants seeking refuge in the safety of first landing. While signs of the enemy were scarce, the town bore the scars of deliberate destruction by its populace, determined to deny their possessions to the foe. They resumed their journey with the first light of dawn, alternating between jogging alongside the Cadian tanks and the Ministorum war train, and perching atop the vehicles. Though many were not accustomed to such exertion, the Emperor's strength coursed through them, fueling their determination and resilience. Amidst the relentless march, the Sisters of Battle sang hymns with unwavering voices, weaving intricate melodies that rose in complexity. At the same time, preachers atop makeshift pulpits delivered fervent sermons accompanied by the train's organ. Through these rituals, they found solace and endurance, maintaining a steady pace despite the challenges. Initially, Ajax's landscapes appeared afflicted, resembling the aftermath of drought or pestilence. Yet, life persisted amidst the wilting forests and agricola lining the highways, albeit overshadowed by rampant weeds and choking algae. These anomalies, though unsettling, initially seemed natural, albeit sinister in appearance. However, as night fell, the rustling of unseen creatures and the foreboding atmosphere prompted caution among the sentries and the faithful, warning against straying from the safety of the road. As the pilgrims approached first landing, the oppressive influence of Nurgle's grip tightened with each league they traversed. By the dawn of the third day, the once verdant trees had decayed into pulpy sticks, their blackened leaves scattered around their bases. The sky, turbulent and foreboding, peeked through the skeletal remains of the foliage, devoid of the usual chorus of animals and avian creatures. Even the resilient creepers wilted, hanging lifeless in slimy tangles from their erstwhile hosts, while the once fertile fields now lay barren, covered in musty straw. Despite their precautions of boiling and treating water under the watchful eye of priests, sickness infiltrated the congregation. A malady of the gut spread swiftly, claiming lives among the weak and vulnerable. While most endured unpleasant symptoms of cramping pains and loose bowels, for some, it proved fatal. Amidst the suffering, a few firebrand preachers attributed the illness to a lack of faith, leading to the cruel abandonment of afflicted pilgrims despite attempts by Mathieu's presbyters to intervene. Others pleaded to be left behind, fearing they would slow the procession. As the mountains of Loan loomed on the horizon, 
their sharp peaks towering over 6,000 feet high, a group of 200 approached Mathieu with a shameful admission. They intended to turn back. With bowed heads, their elders confessed their fear and cowardice, claiming they would escort the ill back to safety. Amidst rumblings of treachery, Mathieu offered solace, speaking of the Emperor's plan for each person, whether to fight or fulfill other roles. This is not a failure of heart, he assured them, but a realization of purpose. They depart with the Emperor's blessing. With Mathieu's words, spirits were revived, and half of the dissenters chose to remain reinvigorated in their resolve. The remaining group departed peacefully, accompanied only by those too sick to continue the journey. Before the imposing wall of mountains, the pilgrims halted for another night, keeping vigilant as strange voices echoed from the enveloping mists, a chilling reminder of the perils lurking in the darkness. The crackling of damp wood punctuated the night, offering a meager reprieve from the chill in the air. Wisps of mist snaked from the earth, casting an eerie ambience over the campsite. Conversations among the faithful around the fires were held in hushed tones, a collective effort to avoid drawing attention to the encroaching fog and whatever malevolent entities might lurk. Despite the land's desolation, a sense of confidence permeated the camp. The pilgrims remained steadfast in their resolve, their spirits buoyed by the righteousness of their cause. Vigilant sentries patrolled the perimeter, their watchful eyes scanning the horizon. Comradeship flourished among the diverse assembly, their individual faiths coalescing into a cohesive whole. Yet, the Cadians provided the bedrock of discipline and experience, their tanks positioned on the outskirts with targeting lenses piercing the crimson haze of the rising fog. Colonel Odremeyer, a figure of renown with his weathered countenance and commanding presence, personally inspected the lines. As he passed, his patrol greeted him with salutes, offering guidance to those in need, without reproach. As the fog thickened, obscuring even the towering war train's smokestacks, Odremeyer remained determined. Passing by a pair of soldiers, their faces unfamiliar amidst the regiment's reduced ranks, Odremeyer exchanged brief pleasantries. Despite his inability to recall their names, the colonel felt a pang of sorrow at the thought of the countless faces lost in battle, unrecognized and unremembered. Engaging in conversation with the younger soldier, Odremeyer acknowledged the biting cold and the disorienting mist that shrouded the once familiar landscape. With a solemn nod, he reassured the soldiers of their resolve to confront the enemy's designs, guided by a steadfast belief in the Emperor's will. As the fires dimmed and the mist thickened, Odremeyer found himself disoriented, his attempts to navigate the camp thwarted by the enveloping haze. Determined to find his bearings without assistance, he pressed on, unwilling to concede to the fog's disorienting grasp. The tolling of a bell echoed through the mist, accompanied by the melodious singing and the gentle hymns of the war train's organ. Guided by the sounds, Colonel Odremeyer navigated through the thick fog until he reached the train's location. There, atop a weapons cupola, stood Mathieu, delivering a sermon to the gathered faithful. Kneeling in reverence, Odremeyer bowed his head as Mathieu concluded the first homily, with a prayer for the Emperor of Terror. Rising to his feet alongside the congregation, he absorbed Mathieu's words of encouragement, urging them not to fear the encroaching fog or the lurking dangers beyond the campfires. They were children of the Emperor, carriers of his divine light, capable of illuminating even the darkest nights. Mathieu's recounting of past encounters with the Emperor stirred fervent responses from the crowd their voices united in praise and adoration. The mist, seemingly intimidated by their faith, retreated as the collective fervor grew stronger. Moved by Mathieu's call to share their testimonies, Odremeyer pondered his own experiences, once characterized by doubt and occasional blasphemy. However, witnessing the undeniable manifestations of the Emperor's power had transformed him. Perhaps now was the time to share his testimony and contribute to spreading the truth about the master of mankind. 
The voices of the faithful rang out, each sharing their own encounters with the divine presence of the Emperor. Amidst the chorus, Mathieu's gaze fixated on Colonel Audra Meyer, prompting him to step forward and share his own testimony. Despite his discomfort and reluctance, Audremeyer found himself drawn toward Mathieu, compelled to join him atop the weapon's cupola. With a heavy heart and a sense of unease gnawing at him, Audremeyer ascended the makeshift pulpit, feeling the weight of Mathieu's gaze. Standing beside the militant apostolic, he hesitated, grappling with his inner turmoil. Mathieu's invitation to share his experience was not one Audremeyer could refuse, and as he opened his mouth to speak, he couldn't shake the feeling of dread that enveloped him. Reluctantly, he recounted the events that had shaken his beliefs and reshaped his understanding of the Emperor's divine presence. Colonel Audremeyer's voice echoed through the mist as he recounted the harrowing trials his regiment faced in the desolate world of Hecatone. His words carried the weight of experience, resonating with the shared struggles and sacrifices of those gathered around the fires. We survived, we men, he continued, his tone grave yet resolute. But it was not merely our training or grit that sustained us. It was something greater, something beyond ourselves. For nearly two months, we battled relentless horror, facing an enemy that wore the faces of our fallen comrades, a foe that threatened not just our bodies, but our minds and souls. As he spoke, Audremeyer's gaze swept over the diverse faces below him, each bearing the marks of hardship and loss. Soldiers from countless worlds, united in their shared struggle against the encroaching darkness, listened intently to his words, seeking solace and strength in his testimony. In the darkest hour, it was one of our own, a regimental preacher who showed us the light, Audremeyer recounted, his voice carrying a note of reverence. And in that moment, we felt the Emperor's presence among us, guiding us, giving us hope when all seemed lost. His testimony hung in the air, a beacon of resilience and faith amidst the encroaching gloom. And as the mist began to thin, revealing his comrades' flickering flames and faces, Audremeyer felt a newfound sense of purpose, a determination to lead his regiment through the trials ahead, bolstered by the belief in the Emperor's divine protection. As Colonel Audremeyer recounted the desperate battle on Hecatone unfolded, a profound silence settled over the crowd, broken only by the solemn cadence of his words. The memory of Frater Othis, the regimental preacher who had shown them the light in their darkest hour, hung heavy in the air, a beacon of hope amidst the encroaching darkness. And on that day, when the enemy's onslaught reached its peak when the sky turned black with swarms of biting flies and the dead rose in a tide of relentless horror, we stood firm, Audremeyer continued, his voice resonating with quiet determination. We, the people of Cadia, warriors born and bred, faced an enemy unlike any we had encountered. The moonbeam sliced through the lingering mist as he spoke, casting a spectral glow upon the gathered throng, it was as if the heavens bore witness to their plight, offering a glimmer of divine guidance in their darkest hour. The dead descended upon us like a tide, overwhelming our defences with sheer numbers, Audremeyer recounted, his words tinged with the grim reality of battle. Scores of brave men and women fell beneath their relentless assault, their courage tested to its limits. Yet amidst the chaos and carnage, Amidst the deafening clamour of battle, there remained a flicker of hope, a steadfast resolve to stand firm against the encroaching darkness. And as Audremeyer spoke, his words echoed with the timeless truth of their shared struggle, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of unspeakable horror. I remember my moments of terror and shame, for Acadian officer should have no fear, and yet I did. I feared to die. Moreover, I feared to become like the dead and be made a slave to the very beings who would destroy all we value. I called a retreat, but my voice was not heard, for my Vox operator choked upon the swarm of insects, his body putrefying in front of me as they packed his mouth with their bodies. 
there was a blast of plasma as my gunner unleashed his gun, and another, greater wash of heat when his weapon exploded. In his panic, he did not purge the firing chamber, and the flies clogged the cooling vents. The rest of my command squad died, blasted apart by the sun gun's failure. I was flung clear, scorched, but alive. It is my great dishonor that I lay there and watched our colors burn in the mud. The dead were coming closer, I could hear their moans, and I prepared to die, yet then another voice came to my ears, that of Othis, and that is when I saw the Emperor at work. Othis advanced calmly, his pistol held up, his chain sword inactive. No temporal weapons did he deploy, but he wielded the word of the Emperor. He sang the great hymns of Cadia, and his voice was loud with his faith, full of a heavenly music and the power of elemental forces. The flies dropped from the sky around him, little more than flecks of blackness trodden underfoot. The dead swung towards him, their dark masters sensing his holiness and light, desiring above all things to douse it. But when they approached, they fell down, truly dead, and they did not rise again. I watched him go, alone, the flies falling around him, the dead stumbling to a final halt, and then he was gone into their midst. My soldiers, in full retreat and close to the edge of breaking only moments before, stood amazed, their weapons hanging from limp fingers. They stared after Frater Otis, into the gap he had pushed into the dead and the swarms. I scrambled up to my feet, my fear forgotten. I took up the standard pole of my color sergeant, paying no heed to the hot metal burn as I brandished it over my head and shouted. With his words ringing in the ears of the faithful, Colonel Odremeyer stood tall amidst the gathering gloom, a beacon of hope amidst the encroaching darkness. And as the moonbeam bathed them in its ethereal glow, the resolve of the congregation was strengthened, their hearts united in purpose and their spirits ablaze with the fires of righteousness. He is with us. The Lord of mankind watches over us, sons and daughters of Cadia. He is with us. Attack, attack, for the Emperor, for terror, for Cadia. There was no strategy only a desperate charge into the teeth of death. By instinct, we formed a wedge, ragged at first, then firmer and deeper as the regiment gathered together and poured up over the trenches. Everyone, infantrymen, artillerymen, tank crew who had lost their mounts, staff officers, the hail, the injured, every tank still running, every person on that battlefront who could hold a gun, Support Auxilia abandoned their crates of power cells and took up the weapons of the fallen. Our Medici put down their stretchers and drew their pistols. Onward, onward, for Cadia. We ran into the foe. They fell before our fury and our faith. Their strength denied them by the power of the God Emperor himself, and we slaughtered them. Their return blows were feeble. Their protective shrouds of flies faded away. I caught one last sight of Othis. Though far ahead, the path he had pushed into the enemy had not closed, as if they could not cross the ground he had walked upon. I saw him hold his holy symbol, a heavy, golden, barred letter I aloft. I had often thought it beautiful, but I did not understand the power of that symbol until that day. There was a blinding flash. I threw up my arms to protect my eyes, but then I saw the light did not hurt my eyes and the blast front that followed touched not one of my warriors, nor did it stir even a hair on their heads. But where it touched the dead, it was another matter. They exploded into ash, showers of it, soft and delicate as snow, and fell to nothing for a mile. The light tore the heart from the horde of the dead. I looked up then and thought I saw a great giant in golden armor in the pillar of holy flame touching the sky. Our God, had come to save us. Then he was gone, and the light was gone, and the sky was clear of toxic cloud, but blue and pure, and the trails of space marine assault craft were grey across it. We were saved by the Emperor. By then, we were too exhausted to do anything other than watch the fire trails of their drop craft. No one cheered. There was no celebration. 
With his words echoing in the hearts of the faithful, Colonel Odremeyer stood amidst the ruins of the battlefield, a symbol of resilience and determination in the face of adversity. And as the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, illuminating the scarred landscape with its gentle glow, the soldiers of Cardia looked to the future with renewed hope, knowing that they marched ever onward in the Emperor's name. Of Frater Othis, there was no sign, only a blackened circle some hundred feet across at the heart of the enemy horde, surrounded by the ash of the dead. After the battle, I reported what I had seen to Lord Gilliman's corps of logisticators. They showed no interest in what I'd witnessed, but I heard rumors of similar happenings and of what happened on the plains of Hecatone. I thought never to see the light of the Emperor again, though I felt blessed to have done so and would have died happy having witnessed it until Frater Mathieu sought me out and questioned me about the battle. I caught the same light in his eyes. That is why I pledged my regiment to the Adeptus Ministorum before we could be inducted into Fleet Primus. And so here we are. I have nothing more to say, said Odremeyer. This is my testimony. The Emperor protects. The gathered faithful murmured their agreement, their hearts uplifted by their testimonies and the conviction with which they had been spoken. In that moment, amidst the ruins of a world beset by darkness, they found solace in the unwavering belief that the Emperor watched over them, guiding their steps and shielding them from harm. And as they prepared to continue their journey, their spirits fortified by the reaffirmation of their faith, they knew that no matter what trials lay ahead, they would face them with unwavering resolve, secure in the knowledge that they marched in the Emperor's name, guided by his divine will. As Mathieu surveyed the desolate landscape, eyes scanning the jagged cliffs and ominous shadows surrounding them, a palpable sense of unease settled over the congregation. The once majestic Loan Mountains, now marred by the festering wound of Odricus's cut, cast a foreboding presence over the scene, their darkened slopes dripping with the tainted black fluid that oozed from their depths. Despite the eerie silence that enveloped them, Mathieu remained vigilant, his gaze sharp and unwavering as he sought any signs of potential danger lurking amidst the shadows. His companions, a diverse array of faithful followers and seasoned warriors, stood ready at his side, their resolve unshaken even in the face of such ominous surroundings. Beside him, the sisters Palatine of the Adepta Sororitas stood as stalwart guardians, their unwavering dedication to the Emperor evident in their vigilant stance and resolute demeanor. Alongside them, Odremeyer's liaisons and presbyters maintained a watchful presence, their expressions reflecting a mixture of apprehension and determination. In this moment of tense anticipation, as the air grew heavy and the distant echoes of the congregation's murmurs mingled with the low hum of the waiting war train, Mathieu knew they stood on the brink of a perilous journey. But guided by their faith and united in their purpose, they would press onward, undaunted by the challenges ahead. With a silent prayer on his lips and the Emperor's light as their beacon, Mathieu raised his hand in a signal to proceed. As the congregation resumed their march, their footsteps echoing against the desolate canyon walls, they carried with them a steadfast resolve and an unwavering belief in the righteousness of their cause. And though the path before them was fraught with danger, they marched forward with steadfast faith, ready to confront whatever trials awaited them in the darkness beyond. As the war train rumbled forward, Mathieu's heart swelled with a mixture of determination and faith. Though doubts lingered in the minds of some, he knew that they were embarking on a path ordained by the Emperor himself. With each echoing thud of the train's advance, he felt the weight of responsibility upon his shoulders, but also the reassuring presence of the Emperor's protection. Despite the ominous surroundings of Odricus's cut, where the shadows seemed to press in from all sides, Mathieu remained steadfast in his conviction. He understood the risks they faced, but he also believed in the guiding light of their faith, which would see them through even the darkest of trials. 
Mathieu's voice rang out again as the train pressed onward through the narrow passage, a beacon of unwavering resolve amid the encroaching darkness. I am not a man of war. I am a man of faith. We go forward. This is our chosen path, shown to me by the Emperor, said Mathieu. We take it under his protection. He turned to look at the assembled leaders. The Emperor protects. With each word he spoke, he sought to instill courage in the hearts of his followers, reminding them that they were not alone, but guided by the Emperor's divine will. Together, they moved forward into the unknown, their spirits bolstered by the collective strength of their faith. Though the path ahead was perilous, they marched onward with unwavering determination, trusting in the Emperor's protection to see them safely through the darkness of Odricus's cut. As the war congregation emerged onto the desolate plain beyond the mountains, they were greeted by utter devastation. What was once fertile farmland and thriving communities had been swallowed by the encroaching corruption of chaos. The land was now submerged beneath murky Stygian waters, with only remnants of buildings and islands protruding from the flooded expanse. The air was thick with a sickly mist, carrying the stench of decay and death. Insects swarmed over the stagnant pools, and the water's surface rippled with unseen movements, hinting at malevolent forces lurking beneath. The once vibrant landscape had been transformed into a nightmarish realm of desolation and despair. As the war train pressed forward into this accursed landscape, Mathieu urged caution. The eerie green clouds above hinted at the looming presence of a storm, crackling with anemic lightning and raining down sulfurous precipitation that burned the skin. Suddenly, a terrifying trumpet blast shattered the oppressive silence, and all eyes turned towards a monstrous figure lumbering towards them through the mist. It was a grotesque creature, with a massive rodent-like head and a tongue that stretched for dozens of yards, lined with rows of yellow eyes. Its mournful cry echoed across the plain, filling the air with a tangible sorrow and despair. Despite the overwhelming dread that enveloped them, the war congregation stood firm, their faith unshaken even in the face of such abomination. They sang louder, their voices rising to drown out the creature's lament as they prepared to confront whatever horrors awaited them in this accursed land. As Colonel Odramaya surveyed the battlefield ahead, he saw hordes of demons arranged in formations reminiscent of ancient warfare, their ranks bristling with spears and axes. Despite his confidence in technology, he quickly realized that conventional firepower would be useless against such supernatural adversaries. When his tanks opened fire, their shells disappeared into the swampy terrain, producing nothing but foul spouts of filth. The daemons, known as plague bearers, remained largely unscathed, merely jostled by the explosions. Even the heavy bolters mounted on the tanks proved ineffective, with only a few demons succumbing to their fire while the rest shrugged off the barrage with mild irritation. Despite the futility of their attacks, Odramaya pressed on, determined to keep the enemy from reaching the war train. Turning his gaze back to the war train, he found solace in its relentless progress through the corrupted marshland. Its white exterior stood starkly against the tainted landscape, symbolizing purity amidst the decay. Odramaya saw the Emperor's will manifest in the train's formidable weaponry, which seemed far more effective against the demonic host than his own tanks. As his tank plowed through the swamp, he couldn't shake the feeling of suffocation brought on by his breathing kit. Despite the physical discomfort, he found reassurance in the train's advance, believing that angels rode alongside it, wielding gold shields to deflect the enemy's sorcerous blasts. However, the treacherous terrain posed additional challenges, with some tanks beginning to struggle as the marsh threatened to engulf them. The corrosive effects of the demonic presence were also taking their toll, rusting the hulls of the vehicles and causing mechanical malfunctions. Despite the odds stacked against them, Odramaya and his comrades pressed forward, their determination unwavering in the face of the relentless onslaught of chaos. As the battle raged on, a sudden cough and bang signaled the demise of a chimera in the rear ranks. 
Time was running out, and every second counted. Colonel Odremeyer urged his comrades onward, invoking the memory of lost Cardia and calling for vengeance and redemption in the name of the Emperor. Despite the imminent danger and the belief that his own death was imminent, Odremeyer felt a holy ecstasy, knowing that he was fulfilling his duty to the Emperor. Amidst the chaos of engines roaring and guns thundering, Odremeyer heard a haunting tallying, a cacophony of misery he felt compelled to interrupt. With a resolute bang on the tank's roof, he urged it forward, and to his amazement, the other tank crews seemed to intuit his desires, increasing their speed in perfect synchronicity, ordained by the God Emperor. As they crashed into the ranks of plague bearers, Odremeyer's tank plowed through the demons, crushing them under its tracks and tearing them apart with relentless firepower. The heavy bolters blazed red hot, their rounds incinerating demonic faces and reducing the foul creatures to clouds of rotten matter that dissipated into the fog. With each passing moment, Odremeyer felt the Emperor's presence guiding their actions, filling him with a sense of purpose and determination to confront the forces of chaos with unwavering resolve. As the Imperial advance pressed on, the storm overhead intensified, with lightning streaking in all directions and thunder rumbling ominously. Colonel Odremeyer's tank charge plowed through the first five ranks of plague bearers. The Colonel himself manning the Pintel Storm Bolter and unleashing a relentless barrage of rounds into the enemy. Lesser imps crowded at the feet of the demons, exploding satisfyingly under the onslaught of firepower. Amidst the chaos of battle, Odremeyer found himself singing the rousing verses of Cardia in Eternum, his voice joined by the entire regiment over the Vox. Despite the fogged up eye lenses and the pain in his throat, he continued firing, his shots finding their marks amidst the densely packed enemy ranks. The tank swayed as the driver maneuvered, using the tracks as weapons to crush the daemons into the soil. The enemy closed in, their leprous arms reaching over the tank's defenses. But Odremeyer remained unharmed, protected by the Emperor's will. Though the tank suffered damage from blades of rusted steel and diseased bone, it pressed on relentlessly, infused with the indomitable spirit of the Emperor. As another tank drove past, clearing the left side of Odremeyer's Lehman Russ, it surged forward, knocking aside its assailants. The echelon of tanks and chimeras continued to carve through the demon horde, their weapons creating brilliant patterns of light across the battlefield. The infantry manned the laser guns along the flanks of the armored vehicles, adding to the onslaught. Finally, they broke through the leading enemy regiments, entering a gap between the first and second lines, pushing onward the Emperor's protection, guiding their every move. They crunched under the treads of Odremeyer's tank as it plowed forward, the Colonel's heart heavy with the losses suffered and the relentless onslaught of horrors before them. Despite the overwhelming odds, he remained resolute, urging his men onward with shouts of, Forward! The tanks accelerated once more, their weapons blazing in defiance. Above, horse-sized flies buzzed ominously, while around them, Lehman Rust tanks met fiery ends or fell victim to the corroding touch of demonic blades. Larger beasts swept through the air, engulfing chimera transports in pulsing mists that transformed them into grotesque fungal masses bearing the faces of their doomed crew. Never-born creatures, wielding blunt blades and vomiting maggots, tore through the armored vehicles with horrifying ease. As the charge pressed into the second line of the enemy's army, the Cadians found themselves outnumbered and outmatched. Odremeyer glanced back at the war train, still making progress towards its destination, finding solace in the thought that their sacrifices would not be in vain. With their numbers dwindling, Odremeyer ordered his tanks to reform into a spear point, pushing through the quagmire towards the base of the hills. Despite the heavy resistance, they fought, determined to carve a path forward. But as they reached the base of the mountains, they found themselves surrounded, attacked on all sides by the relentless tide of demons. As the chaos of battle unfolded around them, 
Odramaya beheld the grim spectacle of destruction wrought by the demonic horde. Flights of horse-sized flies cast ominous shadows overhead, their buzzing wings like a dirge of impending doom. To his right, a Lehman Rust tank erupted in a spectacular explosion. At the same time to his left, another succumbed to the relentless assault of demonic plague blades, its armor corroded and engine rusted solid. Amidst the chaos, a larger beast descended upon them, wielding a flail and a hooked knife with terrifying proficiency. Its toad-like head, adorned with three yellow eyes and a greening horn, regarded Odramaya with malevolent intent. Strips of diseased skin hung from its shoulders, and a grotesque tongue, adorned with a miniature replica of its head, danced menacingly in the air. With grim determination, Odramaya issued the order to bring down the monstrous creature, his voice cutting through the cacophony of battle, relying on sheer will and hope that his command would be understood amidst the chaos. As the Lascanon struck the demon's flank, it grumbled and retaliated by vomiting a stream of bile towards its aggressor. The corrosive liquid dissolved the front of the tank, causing it to cave in and allowing a torrent of worms to pour inside, rendering the vehicle a smoking wreck. The giant daemon, Torpus Spleenbelch, turned its attention to Odramaya with mocking glee. Torpus Spleenbelch addressed Odramaya mockingly, taunting him as the coward of Khazrabalin who fled his birth world. It proclaimed judgment upon Odramaya, declaring him a traitor and deserter, and prepared to deliver the final blow with its flail. Refusing to be intimidated, Odramaya retorted that he was no coward, recounting the valiant fight they waged until the bitter end on their dying world. Despite the doubts that nagged at him, Odramaya reaffirmed his loyalty to the Emperor and awaited his judgment. As Torpus Spleenbelch drew near, Odramaya spread his arms and called upon the Emperor to witness his resolve. Despite the demon's mocking claims, Odramaya placed his faith in the Emperor's judgment, ready to face whatever fate awaited him in the next stage of the cosmic cycle. Odramaya fervently prayed for the Emperor's protection as the demon swung its flail forward. In a moment of divine intervention, a veil seemed to be drawn aside, revealing a glimpse of a glorious yet terrible landscape where gods resided. One of these heavenly beings reached out to him, enveloping him in a shield of protection. In the next instant, a brilliant flash of light shattered the daemon's flail into spinning chunks of metal, miraculously sparing Odramaya from harm. Blinking in astonishment, Odramaya found himself rapturous and murmuring pious invocations, while the great unclean one stared in bewilderment at its sundered weapon. Seizing the opportunity, Odramaya's crew swiftly retaliated. With rusty bearings squealing, the battle cannon swung around and opened fire, sending a shell into the monster's gut. The demon looked down in comical surprise at the wound before the shell detonated, obliterating the creature and scattering its remains in all directions. Despite being covered in disgusting fluids and enduring excruciating pain from the toxic airs, Odramaya remained undaunted. He tore off his breathing mask and, wielding his power sword, stood tall on the turret's inner step, proclaiming the Emperor's presence and urging his comrades forward in the name of terror. With guns blazing and tracks churning, the remaining soldiers of the Cadian 4,021st Armoured Regiment pressed on towards their objective, fueled by faith and determination to fulfill their duty to the Emperor. From the north, help had arrived. Their path took them through the rear lines of the Plague Horde, where they saw Astra Militarum tanks entangled in vast mobs of demons. Space Marines, commanded by Commander Edemo of the Nova Marines, swiftly issued orders to lend assistance, directing the Repulsor's turret to engage. With precision, the tank's sophisticated machine spirits aligned the barrel and unleashed a spear of brilliant light, shattering a greater diamond's weapon and annihilating it. The Gatling cannon whirred to life, shredding dozens of lesser daemons as the tanks sped by. The impulsors joined in, unleashing a barrage of bolt weapons to further thin the horde's ranks. As they continued firing, 
The pressure from the rear ranks of demons diminished, alleviating the threat to the Cadians and allowing the Astra Militarum tanks to advance. With the chaos subsiding, Edamo voxed orders to the Astra Militarum tanks, directing them to rendezvous with the Space Marines at the facility. As they approached the wrecked facility, the Repulsor Executioner diverted, deploying a squad of eradicators near the Medici building. Vassalon's squad swiftly disembarked, while Justinian slowed the Impulsor to drop off the assault intercessors before speeding towards the war train, leaving the other tanks to continue firing on the Horde. As they raced forward at top speed, the swarms of flies became nothing more than smears across the hull of the war train. Despite the mob of demons attempting to impede its progress up the hill, the train's formidable weaponry incinerated them, and its sheer mass pressed onward like imperial retribution. The fighting decks were crowded with people, armed chiefly with simple weapons and lacking protective gear. Yet they valiantly fought off the attacking daemons. The last barrier collapsed as they observed, allowing airborne demons to descend upon the defenders, wreaking havoc. Plague bearers began to swarm the train, attempting to board it. Amid the chaos, Orpino continued to fire, his tank bouncing on its grav cushion as it crushed through the enemy ranks. Achilleos and Maxentius Drontio knelt on the transit bay benches, unleashing a torrent of gunfire, while Pasak manned the storm bolters, creating a corridor through the demon horde. Despite the resilience of the demons, they seemed weaker than expected when faced with the war train's onslaught. Brother Sergeant Justinian hailed the war train, identifying himself as a member of the Nova Marines and requesting status and tactical objectives. Frater Mathieu responded, expressing his determination to reach the Medici building despite the imminent orbital bombardment. Justinian advised holding position, but Mathieu insisted on pressing forward, seeing the Space Marines as angels sent by the Emperor to lead him to his destiny. With Justinian's approval, Maxentius Drontio directed the squad to follow the train and escort it up the hill. As the Impulsor made its way back towards the war train, its maneuvering thrusters clearing a path through the remaining demons on the hillside, the chaos of the battlefield was palpable. The war train's relentless firepower had decimated thousands of daemons, eliminating their leaders and disrupting their organization, while Orpino and Pasak focused on mowing down the foot soldiers. Justinian and his squad targeted the specialized daemons, heralds, sorcerers and other officers, picking them off from a distance to avoid the dangers of their potent diseases. The battlefield was a maelstrom of destruction, with orbital strikes raining down unpredictably, illuminating the sky with bursts of lightning and thunder. Justinian observed that these were lance strikes, indicating a need for precise targeting data from the fleet despite their reconnaissance efforts. As they sped down the hill, narrowly avoiding being struck themselves, Justinian attempted to communicate with Frater Mathieu, urging him to prepare for evacuation. However, the chaotic din of battle and the failing Vox made it uncertain whether his message was received. Achilles remarked on the possibility of an intelligence working against the train, using dark magics to hasten its decay. Despite its previous resistance, the train now seemed to succumb to decay faster than anything else in the area, and there was a sense of malevolent attention focused on Squad Paris as they approached the train's forward arc. Their helm displays flickered, and the power levels in their armor dropped a testament to the overwhelming presence of the warp in that cursed place. I have never felt something this wicked, Maxentius Drontio remarked grimly. The warp is strong here. They declared they were witnessing the influence of one of the great powers. The plague god himself was fixated on the priest. This revelation disquieted Justinian, while Maxentius Drontio recognized the priest as a significant threat. With his trust in the Vox systems shattered, Justinian resorted to physical means to command the driver. A catastrophic event unfolded as the Impulsor maneuvered sideways to approach the train from a safer angle. The train emitted a deafening metallic groan, followed by a massive jet of steam shooting into the sky as its weapon systems halted. Rust consumed the plasma cannon's bearings, 
causing it to break free and vent plasma in all directions, incinerating pilgrims and demons alike. As the train shuddered to a stop, Justinian ordered the Impulsor to halt at its flank, maintaining a clear path for escape. Despite the unhealthy sounds emanating from the Impulsor's engines, Justinian resolved to retrieve Frater Mathieu himself. Wait here, he instructed his squadmates. Keep an escape corridor clear. I'm going to fetch him. Justinian ascended the train, grappling past deteriorating embellishments and through scenes of horror and decay. Angels' faces warped into grotesque forms, and pilgrims lay dying in pools of filth. He pressed on, fighting off demons and reanimated corpses, his armor and systems failing under the strain of the train's rapid deterioration. Reaching the pinnacle, he confronted a demon riding a monstrous fly, dispatching it with a well-placed shot. Surrounded by death and decay, he found Frater Mathieu standing amidst the ruins, untouched by the corruption consuming the others. Mathieu appeared serene, repeating a mantra of devotion as he clutched his inert servo skull. Realizing the situation's urgency, Justinian urged Mathieu to leave the failing train. Despite the chaos around him, Mathieu seemed fixated on a singular purpose, to reach the nearby facility. Yes, I must, Mathieu responded, pointing towards the facility with unwavering determination. As the last remnants of the Cadians approached the mill, only five tanks remained of their once glorious charge. The landscape was littered with the wreckage of their fallen comrades, now melded into the swampy terrain by time and decay. Some tanks had become overgrown with vegetation, while others had been twisted by chaos into grotesque abominations. Yet Odremeyer remained resolute, his belief in the Emperor unshaken. Despite their battered condition, the remaining tanks pressed forward, their guns dry or seized up, but their sheer mass still a force to be reckoned with. With his voice strained and breath shallow, Odremeyer urged them onward, driven by the sight of the ongoing orbital bombardment and the sounds of battle from the Medici facility. Odremeyer's tanks encountered scattered and disorganized enemy forces as they advanced, crushing demons beneath their tracks. Though they posed a threat, the demons lacked coordination, and one by one, Odremeyer's tanks fell victim to their relentless assault. Nevertheless, they refused to falter, rallying his crew with cries of, For the Emperor! For Cadia! For the Imperium! As they approached the wall of the Medici facility, he braced himself, determined to press on until the very end, despite the odds stacked against them. As plague bearers surged from all directions, Justinian and the remaining Space Marines formed a protective circle around Frater Mathieu, their weapons blazing at the encroaching horde. Justinian noticed an unusual light emanating from the priest, seemingly shielding them from harm. Stay by the priest, Justinian commanded, acknowledging the protective aura surrounding Mathieu. The Emperor shields you, Mathieu murmured, his voice distant yet resolute, his grip tight on his servo skull. Take me to the cauldron. The Emperor commands it. Justinian, compelled by a sense of duty and necessity, directed his comrades to heed Mathieu's words and guide him towards the cauldron, despite the relentless onslaught of the demonic horde. As they fought through the throng of plague bearers, Maxentius Drontio exhausted his ammunition and resorted to close combat, his combat knife slashing through the enemy ranks with deadly precision. However, the Space Marines soon found themselves overwhelmed by the sheer number of foes pressing in on all sides. Amidst the chaos, Mathieu fervently prayed to the Emperor, offering himself as an instrument of divine will to defeat the wicked forces of pestilence and deliverance to the suffering world of Ajax. Though Mathieu's psychic presence weakened the demons and shielded his comrades from their malevolent afflictions, the appearance of a great unclean one, gravely wounded but still formidable, threatened to crush their hopes of reaching the cauldron. With the monstrous demon bearing down on them, Justinian braced himself for the final, desperate confrontation, uncertain if they could overcome such a formidable adversary in their weakened state. As the great unclean one, Kugath, faced the onslaught of the Space Marines' gunfire, 
it retaliated with a vile torrent of demon spew aimed at the Nova Marines. However, Mathieu's invocation to the Emperor created a protective barrier, shielding the Space Marines from the foul substance. Undeterred by their initial attempt to repel it with gunfire, Kugath readied its massive sword, preparing for a physical confrontation. Sensing the danger, Justinian swiftly ordered his comrades to split up, attempting to evade the demon's lethal strikes. Tragically, Vassilon fell to the demon's blade, crushed by its immense force. As Kugath focused on Justinian, the Space Marine Sergeant valiantly defended Frater Mathieu, urging him towards the cauldron while continuing to fire his bolt pistol. Despite his efforts, Justinian realized that Kugath's regenerative abilities posed a formidable challenge. However, before Kugath could strike again, the chamber's outer wall shattered as a Lehman Russ battle tank bearing Colonel Odremeyer's heraldry burst into the scene, ramming into the great unclean one with tremendous force. The impact impaled Kugath on the tank's barrel, momentarily incapacitating the demon. Yet as the tank became enveloped in the foul energies of the warp, it began to degrade and mutate, succumbing to Kugath's corrupting influence. Despite the grotesque transformation, Odremaya, determined to fulfill his duty, struggled to free himself from the melding flesh and pressed on towards the demon. Facing the wounded but still defiant in front of Kugath, Odremaya, though grievously injured, confronted the demon with resolve, defiant in the face of the monstrous entity's mockery. As Odremaya's life faded, he delivered a final blow to Kugath, plunging his power sword into the demon's empty eye socket, driven by his loyalty to the Emperor. With a burst of energy from the failing generator, Kugath's mind was seared, and his soul fled, facing the disapproval of his grandfather Nurgle. Despite losing their lord, the Plaguebearers continued their assault with renewed ferocity. The remaining Nova Marines fought valiantly, but were overwhelmed by the relentless horde. Meanwhile, guided by his faith, Mathieu crawled towards the cauldron, enduring the searing pain of its evil magic as he reached out to it in his final act of service to the Emperor. As his hand touched the iron surface, a blinding light engulfed him, accompanied by soul-rending screams that scattered the plaguebearers and flung the space marines away. In the brilliant radiance, Justinian, thrown against the wall, witnessed Mathieu's transformation and the cauldron's disappearance. In that fleeting moment, he perceived a vision of a golden giant wielding a flaming sword, bringing judgment upon the cauldron with sorrowful determination. Amidst the tolling of a great bell, a sensation of profound release swept through the psychic maelstrom, purging all traces of corruption and the warp's touch. Overwhelmed by the experience, Justinian succumbed to unconsciousness, finding solace in the oblivion it offered. We know the broad strokes etched into the historical record. Gilliman faced Mortarion himself in the heart of the warp-tainted plague garden. Blade met blade, demigod clashed with demon, and the fate of Ultramar and perhaps the Imperium itself hung in the fetid air. Yet even the most extensive historical accounts falter, obscured by the chaotic nature of the warp, and, I suspect, deliberate obfuscation in the aftermath. The details of Gilliman's escape from that duel remain shrouded, but we can say this with certainty. Mathieu saved him. Mathieu is a humble battle brother, not a Terminator armored marine or a renowned captain, but an uncomplicated soul whose name would have otherwise faded. This fact alone speaks volumes, colleagues. Nurgle's garden is anathema to the disciplined order. Within its boundaries, even the mighty can be laid low, not just by blade or toxin, but by doubt, despair, and the creeping tendrils of corruption. Perhaps his faith was so pure, it pierced the miasma of the warp like a lance of holy light. Maybe not faith, but a burning loyalty beyond reason propelled him. Accounts gleaned from survivors of that ill-fated expedition hint at a confrontation atop a rotting spire, a plague cauldron bubbling with virulent energy, and Gilliman held fast by the implacable grip of his demon brother. 
the truth may well be lost to time. But this we know. When the smoke cleared, the cauldron lay in ruins, its corrupt energies dispersed. Those around heard a booming voice. It was Gilliman. Hear me. He roared. I am the last loyal son of the Emperor of Terror. It is not your destiny to end today, God of Plague. But know that I am coming for you, and I will find you, and you will burn. Whispers persist, fragments gleaned from survivors. Mathieu, mortally wounded, reaching out his hand, not in desperation, but with resolute purpose, an aura of golden light. Could it be that the Emperor saw fit to intervene, not to save Frater Mathieu himself, but to transform him into a conduit, a vessel for his divine will? The destruction of the cauldron may have been a necessary act, denying Mortarion his final victory. Yet I posit a far more intriguing possibility. What if Mathieu was not extinguished in that moment, but ascended? His physical form consumed, yes, but his spirit, ablaze with the Emperor's light, carried forth from the warp into a reality beyond our comprehension. Perhaps he stood briefly before the Golden Throne, a mortal soul given unimaginable purpose. Maybe he delivered a message to Gwilliman, words of warning, fortitude, and strategic insights that only the Emperor could have foreseen. A final act of service, a last message to our Lord Regent. Mathieu's story, this tale of potential ascension, sacrifice, and defiance, is a reminder that the Imperium is a stage upon which countless dramas unfold unseen. These small, seemingly inconsequential acts may echo through the ages. And perhaps, somewhere beyond our sight, Mathieu stands vigil, not in death, but in a form we cannot begin to comprehend. We remember his sacrifice. We remember Saint Mathieu and the witnesses 